Imaging and low back pain. If the patient is young, you don't have to get x-rays in the first six to eight weeks unless the patient have a history of significant trauma, so you're suspecting a fracture, or the patient have a history of cancer or have constitutional symptoms that indicate infection, or the patient is taking steroids for a long time and you suspect a compression fracture, or the patient has bladder and bowel symptoms and you're suspecting coda equina, then you start with getting x-rays of the spine first, AP and lateral of the lumbosacral spine. That should be the first study that is used to evaluate the lumbar spine. A lot of people come to the office with MRI and there's no plain films. So when do you get an x-ray? You get an x-ray if the patient had low back pain for six to eight weeks and not getting better with conservative treatment. If the patient has red flags for infection or malignancy or trauma, then you need to get the x-rays early. Don't wait six to eight weeks. I think age should be a red flag. 50 years old is not 20 years old. 50 years old patient should get an x-ray of the spine, which is different than a 20 years old. This one you may want to sit tight and don't get x-rays right away. So you will get the x-rays and you find nothing. Then you start thinking about an MRI. You get an MRI in case you suspect malignancy for infection in patient with neurological deficit or if the patient has isolated back pain that unresponsive to conservative treatment for about three months. You may want to get the MRI in patient that have radiculopathy, means leg pain, sciatica, and the patient is not getting better with conservative treatment especially if the pain becomes more severe or the patient will have more symptoms or more findings. The problem of MRI is a lot of false positive. So MRI alone is not good enough. These false positive findings are not unique to the spine. You can find them on different parts of the body, such as the shoulder, the hips, and the ankle. In asymptomatic people, 25 to 37 percent will have abnormal disc. So almost like one third of the asymptomatic patient will have an abnormal disc if you get the MRI. The MRI is really sensitive. So the sensitivity is the true positives over false negatives plus true positives. There's really very few false negatives because everybody's MRI will show something. So that false negative is very narrow. But the false positive MRI scan, which is 35% of patients younger than 4 years old and 90% of patients more than 6 years old, these are patients that are asymptomatic, will show problems in the disc. So there is a lot of false positive. So what does the false positive do? The false positives will ruin the specificity of the MRI. So what is specificity in general? It is a true negative over false positive and true negative. And since the false positive is a lot, the number is huge, then the specificity of the MRI is bad. The MRI is not specific for disc herniation. And to make the situation worse, the MRI is hard to interpret with a recurrent disc herniation. So you use gadolinium dye with the MRI, and that will show the difference between a recurrent disc herniation, which will be cold, or 
will be less vascular, or fibrosis, which will light up, will be vascular. If you suspect a recurrent disc herniation and the patient have symptoms, you may want to do surgery if the area is cold, not vascular, which means it is a recurrent disc herniation that could get better with surgery. But if the area is vascular, it lights up, then it is fibrosis or adhesions and is not a recurrent disc herniation and surgery will not be helpful. So with these difficulties with the MRI, you don't know if the patient that's injured in a car accident and his spine MRI showed a disc herniation, you don't know if this is from the car accident or not. You don't know if the patient had the disc herniation prior to the accident and asymptomatic. Now the patient has a sprain back. Somebody got the MRI and you can see the disc herniation or bulge or degeneration or changes. And when you see a patient in your office that has back pain, you don't know if that disc in the MRI causing this back pain or not. So you need to correlate imaging with the clinical findings because there's a lot of false positive MRI scans. So from your exam and the history of the patient, if the patient complains of sciatica, means leg pain, and the straight leg raise is positive, and you have some neurologic changes, maybe the big toe is weak or decreased sensation on the top of the foot, like L5, or the lateral side of the foot, like S1, and you find a disc on the MRI that correspond to the same level of your examination, then there is 95% the patient will improve with the surgery. If you find that the patient has sciatica and the straight leg raise is positive and the MRI is positive, then it is about 86% of the time the patient will have a disc herniation and will get better with surgery. But if you find the only thing the patient has is a positive straight leg raise, then the chance of having disc herniation is about 66% and chance of getting better with surgery drops. So MRI findings alone that does not correspond to the clinical picture have no value. The patient's symptoms must correlate the clinical examination with the MRI findings. If you have a positive findings in the MRI that does not correspond to the clinical findings, then you need to assure the patient and watch the MRI findings. Especially these findings are common with age. Here you can see the clinical findings of disc herniation that affects L4 nerve root, L5 nerve root, and S1 nerve root. Remember, when it is posterolateral disc herniation, it will affect the lower or the traversing nerve root, like L4-5 will affect L5 nerve root. 95% disc herniation involves L4-L5 and L5-S1 levels. The posterolateral disc herniation, which is paracentral, is the most common type with the incidence of approximately 90 to 95 percent. The most common level involved is L5 S1 and that will affect the S1 nerve root. The foraminal disc herniation is less common, about 5 to 10 percent, and will affect the exiting nerve root, which is the upper nerve root.
So if L5 S1 level, it will affect L5 nerve root. When do you do a stat MRI? If the patient have neurologic deficit or if you suspect coda equina? If you suspect coda equina, you probably need to admit the patient. Don't let the patient go home. Patients with coda equina could have bladder and bowel symptoms. And it can be irreversible if the diagnosis and the treatment is not done urgently. So you need to get a STAT MRI. Another scenario where you may need a STAT MRI is an enclosing spondylitis patient that had a minor trauma or a ground level fall and complains of back pain, then you need to admit the patient and you probably will need to get a STAT MRI. Why you get an MRI? To rule out the presence of a fracture and to make sure the patient does not displace a non-displaced fracture that can cause neurological deficit to the patient. What if you cannot get an MRI because the patient has a pacemaker? Then you do CT myelogram. What if the patient has upper motor neuron lesion and they have low back pain? Then you need to get MRI of the C-spine. Occasionally, you may want to get bone scan if the patient has infection or tumor, which is rare, but the bone scan will show multiple lesions. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.